When I looked at the subject matter, postmodernism and philosophy, at one o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> I didn't know if it was a test of your mental agility, my capacity to engender interest, or both, especially since Chesterton said everyone's worldview changes dramatically 30 minutes after lunch. <laughs> so I don't know what worldview you've brought here, but we are going to push you to the limit. The only good news for you is it'll be easier to grapple with me than to grapple with Al Muller, who follows later. <laughs> Even the sign language gentleman was just telling me, he says, this is a tough bunch to interpret for. He said, uh, but this is the first time I've been paid a compliment. He said, but actually, you're easier than Al Muller. He's just so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> So we are here to balance, <laughs> balance the, the stakes here and give you a good, fair expression of what this, this theme is about. You will have to bear with us, humor aside. These are tough subjects. If you deal with them in a surface manner, you do injustice to the theme, and you're unfair to the protagonists on that side of the issue. So at times, you might just wonder where this is headed whether you're really going to be able to come to terms with the ideas or you may just uh, want to switch off, don't. Because the bottom line is that it is a worldview that needs to be responded to, needs to be dealt with. It has some surface issues, but it also has some philosophical underpinnings. And the goal will be, hopefully, by the time all of the speakers are done, to give you both the surface understanding of it and the depth understanding of it. John Reed, the well-known uh, Anglican bishop of years gone by from Sydney, Australia, was on one occasion telling this story. I forget what the context was, but as soon as he finished telling the story, I thought to myself, that is a classic illustration of postmodern thinking. He talked about these two Australian sailors who just gotten off the boat in England and wandered out into the night to enjoy the nightlife, and they stepped into an English pub enjoying all the offerings for the night there. They had inebriated quite a bit and stepped out of the pub, wobbling on their feet into a den dense London fog. And as they were staggering there outside the pub, they saw a man coming in unknown to them. He was a highly decorated British naval officer. And so they waited till he came close and he said to them, they said to him, say a bloke, do you know where we are? The English naval officer, rather offended by this, looked at them and said, do you men know who I am? At which point one Aussie said to the other, we are really in a mess now. We don't know where we are and he doesn't know who he is. <clears throat> that is the quintessential explanation of what postmodernism is all about. We don't know where we are. We don't know who we are. And yet we are pontificating with rather thick volumes on all of this. Last year I was asked to speak at Johns Hopkins on the theme, what does it mean to be human? Now I like the fact that they wanted it defined. But isn't it fascinating? 2006, we're still trying to figure out who we are. I don't hear of dogs getting together to define dogginess. We're supposed to be at the highest rung of the ladder, and we don't know who we are, and we are doing the defining. If we don't know what it means to be human, what does humanism mean? What, all, what was all this writing on humanistic ways of determining ethics and so on? But there's another story I want to link into this. Some years ago, I was speaking at one of the major bar associations of the country, and when I arrived there, I was sitting at the head table and the woman who was uh, the head of the bar association looked at me and said, you must be a very bold man. I said, why do you say that? She said, because you're dealing with a subject here to an audience who are peddlers with words. I said, so I'm supposed to be nervous? She said, yes. I said, frankly, I wasn't until now. <laughs> so I, this was, by the way, in the days when the famous statement was made, it all depends on what the word is means, <laughs> made by a rather notable character. 
And so here they sat with their arms folded. It was lunch hour again. And I was to talk to them about the meaning of words. And I said, before I go into this, let me tell you what the first three items on the news were. I said, I was watching a television program on the news, and these were the first three items. Question number one was being raised, do words have any meaning? Or does the speaker reserve the right to fuse his or her words with his or her own meaning? Is there an ontic referent? Is there a point of reference for language? Or does the speaker determine that right to say whatever he or she wants and mean whatever he or she wants? And in our salvation by survey culture, the, ro the roving cameraman went around asking the world, do words have any meaning or do we reserve the right to fuse our words with any meaning we choose to? If the words didn't have any meaning, what does the question actually mean? <laughs> but they don't ask such questions of themselves. And the survey said, words do not have any meaning, the speaker deserves, deserves the right to fuse it with his or her meaning. So that was the first item on the news. I said the second item on the news was, does morality have any absolute? Or does each individual reserve the right to choose his or her own morality? And so the cameraman went around again. Answer, morality doesn't have any absolute. You reserve the right to make your own relativistic choices. I said, first item, do words have any meaning? Answer, no, you reserve the right to fuse it. Does morality have any absolute? No, you reserve the right to be relative at your own whim. I said, do you know what the third item on the news was? We had just sent Saddam Hussein a warning that if he didn't stop playing his word games, we were going to start bombing him. <laughs> the arms went down. The peddlers with words were willing to listen. You see, we expect of the listener to be held responsible for what he or she has just been told, but we don't give ourselves the same responsibility when we want to flirt with the edges and do whatever it is we want to do. But how did postmodernism come to be? How did these ideas actually gain such popularity and find philosophers to back it? Was it not George Will who said there's nothing so vulgar left in human experience but that we can fly some professor from somewhere to justify it? Postmodernism became like that. But if you go back across the five centuries, in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, all the way down to, to the last century, the 20th century, first it was rationalism stern. I think, therefore I am. You wanted to hold to your beliefs with indubitable rational certainty. But on the heels of that, the empiricists came along. That the only world you can really speak with certainty is the phenomenal world which you can empirically verify. And logical positivism was being birthed. And the ideas of reality were then framed in this sort of scientific single vision. So from rationalism, we moved on to empiricism. Empiricism gradually gave way, and in the 1800s, Darwin, with his uh, origin of species and so on, began to ground it all within a naturalistic framework. From rationalism to empiricism to naturalism. Existentialism then was birthed in the 1900s on the heels of the writing of the previous century just begun by people like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and so on. So existentialism began to hold sway on the minds of young university students starting from Europe, moving across the waters, and then finding anchor points out here. So you moved all the way from rationalism to empiricism to naturalism to existentialism. Postmodernism was waiting to be born in throwing off the single vision of all of these. It became the kind of an eclectic system. Take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and make yourself the centerpiece of all philosophizing. Now, many times you'll hear authors say something like this. Modernity reigned some from 1789, the storming of the Bastille in France, to 1989, the fall of the wall in Berlin. Those 200 years are generally given that parenthetical portion of the modern world. But that is done mainly just for some kind of convenience. The fact of the matter is, the writings of Wittgenstein and Saussure and Nietzsche had already paved the way for what postmodernity was going to become. In fact, some of the most vociferous spokespersons for postmodernism, P. 
people like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault had already done their US bit of speaking. It was in 1985 that Derrida came to Johns Hopkins and deconstructed the entire United States Constitution in front of that audience to a round a resounding applause. It was in 84 that Michel Foucault, who embodied postmodernism, died that horrific death with his body plagued by AIDS and completely destroyed his health. So when we say 1989, we are just using it as a kind of a convenient 200 century mark. The fact of the matter is, the damage in thinking had already been done. In fact, it was in the 1970s that Malcolm Muggeridge said, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down until at last having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. It was in the 70s. So the work was done, the seeds were sown, the soil was prepared. But you know what? Where postmodernism was really born, it was born in Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? Is propositional truth absolute? Can you be certain that this is exactly what the creator has actually meant? And then he goes on, she, he goes on to say, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch, touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. That's it. Did God really say? And if you violate God's command, you play God and you redefine good and evil. Muggeridge said all new news is old news happening to new people. Jacques Derrida and Foucault and all didn't come up with some new ideas of postmodernism. It happened right in the beginning of the garden, questioning whether God had really spoken and was it not possible to redefine his reality and do it on your own terms. But the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, it has gained currency, it has gained vogue. People like Richard Rorty and others will talk about their own pilgrimage. Ironically, Rorty makes the comment that in the beginning he had some interest in Christianity. He would read the gospels and so on, but he saw its demands of humility and he could not bring himself to that point. And he turned his back on this challenge to be humble and became then one of the gurus of postmodern philosophy and postmodern thought. What I want to give for you very plainly and very quickly is three or four principal ideas of what are the major tenets, philosophical tenets of postmodernism, and we will race through them. The first is this, they do not believe there is an objective reference for words. There is no reference for words of a language. So please listen to their own definition here very carefully. It is based on an it is based on an epistemology that holds to a limitless instability of words, on an epistemology, a truth basis that holds to the limitless instability of words. Texts are stripped of their meaning and words are given no point of reference. There is a limitless instability in language. Words do not have a point of reference. You have your point of reference for language, I have my point of reference, and so the ground is always shifting in speech and in thought and in any form of propositional truth. Fascinatingly, Paul DeMann, one of the spokespersons for uh, trying to sustain this point, of all places he goes to Archie Bunker. 
For those of you in less than that generation, this was quite the show of all shows that broke all of the revered kinds of humor about 30 years ago. So Archie Bunker, what was his name? Carol O'Connor and Gene Stapleton, Archie Bunker and Edith Bunker. He was sort of the quintessential right-wing snob who bullied his wife and bullied everybody else and sneered at everyone else. And Edith was sort of that half-dumb wit but was actually smarter than him. <laughs> and so at one point he says to her, Edith, this is Paul DeMann, by the way, giving this illustration. Edith, would you pack my bowling shoes into the bag? And so Edith says, Archie, would you like them laced from the top or from the bottom? And you can just see the expression. He says, Edith, what's the difference? And she goes into a prolonged answer on what muscles are held in place with the top lacing over against the underlacing. And the audience is roaring. And Archie Bunker is just staring at her, incredulous. Paul DeMond says, this proves, now brace yourself for this statement, here's what he says, this proves that rhetoric radically suspends logic and opens up vertiginous possibilities of referential aberration. <laughs> what? <laughs> that rhetoric radically suspends logic and opens up vertiginous possibility of referential aberration. What he's really saying is, it takes you to dizzying heights of meaninglessness. <laughs> what Paul DeMond does not understand is that the reason the audience was laughing was because Edith did not understand Archie's question. Archie was really saying, I couldn't get this. Do it at the top, do it at the bottom. She's going into this physiological impact of lacing shoes. But you know, they move from this horrible sense of superficiality to something that becomes extremely serious. And here's where I want to read for you this notation. Anthony Freeman in his book, God in Us, A Case for Christian Humanism, talks about what the postmodernist actually means by language and how they make the charge. Listen carefully now. He is dealing with Isaiah 44, 14 to 17. He quotes the verse and then responds to it. Follow me carefully. The prophet Isaiah says, all who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. He cuts down cedars, which some of it he takes and warms himself, and he kindles a fire and bakes bread, but he also fashions a god and worships it. He then prays to it and says, save me, you are my God. So he takes the tree, cuts it down, makes an idol, worships that idol. In the end, it's something that he has fabricated with his own hands. Anthony Freeman says, that's what the prophet Isaiah says. But listen to what Freeman goes on to add. He says this, the writer who is Isaiah failed to realize how close his own case was to that of the pagan whom he was lampooning. The idol worshiper had constructed his own idol with wood, had constructed his idol with wood. The author made his God out of words. That really was the only difference. You see it? Isaiah talks about the idolater who takes wood and then proceeds with that wood to make an idol and proceeds with that idol to then bow down and worship it. Freeman says, you know, what Isaiah doesn't realize, he's made his own idol with language and then fabricating this idea of God and he's bowing down and worshiping before his own language. That's what this is all about. The limitless instability of words. That words actually do not have an ultimate point of reference and what happens at the end is that we manufacture reality by the words we use. Listen to one new, how Nietzsche said it. The real truth about objective truth is that the latter is just a fiction. Every candidate for truth must first be expressed in language, and language is notoriously unable to get us to reality. Words like a hall of mirrors reflect only each other, 
and in the end point back to the condition of their users without having established anything about the way things really are. Truth is the name, says Nietzsche. We give to that which agrees with our own instinctive preferences. It is what we call our interpretation of the world, especially when we want to foist it upon others. It's like a hall of mirrors, smoke and, smoke and mirrors as it were. We're just using words, they reflect back, they bounce back. It only really reveals what we want to term as truth. But ironically, a few stanzas later, here's what he says. But I still am too pious that even I worship at the altar where God's name is truth. What Nietzsche is saying is, yes, it's all about words, but let me tell you something. At the end of the day, I too believe there's some such thing as truth because I cannot deny truth at the same time believing that my denial is not truthful. You know, there was an old Irish farmer, and the Irish have a way of saying things. It is something like this, the story goes. A tourist is driving around, and he gets lost way out in some hinterland in parts of Ireland there. And he looks at a farmer and he says, can you tell me how to get to such and such a place? And the farmer stops and says to him, if that's where you are going, this is not where I would begin. <laughs> if postmodernism wants to end up with autonomy, this is not where to begin. But this is where they begin. They basically end up cutting the branch on which they are sitting. They are talking about the limitless instability of words, but they use words and words and words and words and words, telling us that their philosophy is actually quite stable because they are explaining it so thoroughly. So the first point is basically there is no point of reference for words. Secondly, there, is no, there are no laws of logic which we should see, be seen as superintending or governing our discourse. No indubitable laws of logic. The laws of logic are cerebral, they are sort of ways in which we construct our own Western world or Eastern world. There are actually no laws of logic that are undeniable. Now the truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, when you go to the laws of logic, there are fundamentally four. There are many subsets under these, but fundamentally there are four. One is the, the law of identity. When you have identified something as A, you're not talking about non-A. The second is the law of non-contradiction. The third is the law of the excluded middle, which basically means just because two things have one thing in common does not mean that they have everything in common. And fourth is the law of rational inference. The law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, and the law of rational inference. These are the four fundamental laws of logic which we assume or are subsumed in our discourse. But the postmodern thinkers logically want to argue that logic doesn't really work. They want to debunk this notion of logic. What fascinates me, absolutely fascinates me, when I became a Christian in the 60s, and I would start visiting campuses and so on, they would ask me for reasons why I have become a Christian. And I remember struggling sometimes to answer their questions. And so I made it a pursuit of my life to study the relevant answers to such honest questioners. Now when you give the same answers, do you know what they say to you? Ah, oh, this thing's too rational. There's too much of logic involved in all of this. The moment they've been beaten at their own game, they want to change the rules and the terms of engagement. This is precisely what's happened in our university campuses. The law of non-contradiction is being jettisoned and denied. When I finished a talk at the University of Iowa, a student ran to the microphone, she cupped her hands and shouted out at me. William Lane Craig and I were doing some open forums out there together. The place was packed. And she looked at me and shouted out, who ever told you that our answers to life needed to be coherent? Where did you get this from? Is this not another Western way of foisting its worldview upon others? And she went on and on. One of the secrets to answering a question is let the questioner talk long enough and they will convict themselves. 
And so when she finished, I said, ma'am, I'll be glad to answer your question. I just have one question for you. When I answer you now, do you want my answer to be coherent or may my answer be incoherent? <laughs> and the audience roared and I said, you know what? I said, hold that laughter. I said, I really want to know where she's coming from. Is she comfortable with contradiction only in herself? Or is she comfortable in contradiction with any counter perspectives as well? You may have heard this, so forgive me for repeating it if it's familiar too, but this happened years ago, and then I'll move to my next couple of points. It was in Santa Barbara, California. It was in the 1980s or so. And I was dealing with a series of talks on why I believe Jesus Christ to be the only way to God. And a professor of philosophy, an American gentleman, came up to the front and said to me, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to deal with the subject, why you're not a Hindu, he said. He said, because I have become a Hindu. I said, well, I'd be interested in hearing why you have, and so on and so forth. I said, this is fascinating. He said, no, 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 you don't need to hear that. I want to hear from you why you're not one. I said, you want me to take a whole talk on that? He said, yeah. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, you know, I learned a long time ago when you throw mud at others, not only do you lose a lot of ground, but you also get your hands dirty. He didn't find that funny. He just looked at it, looked at me, and he said, he said, no, no, I want to take you on. He said, you know what? I'll challenge you. You speak on why you're not a follower of that worldview. I'll bring my whole class on philosophy, and we'll rip you apart at the end of it. I said, that's supposed to be an inviting feeling for me. <laughs> I said, look, I'll make a deal with you. Let's go out for lunch. And I gave him my famous line, you pay, I'll pray, and we'll have a good time together. I said, I don't want to impress your students. I don't want you to impress anybody else. It's just you and me. He said, can I bring the professor of psychology with me? I've always wondered why he wanted to do that. Whether we were going to be two subjects under scrutiny or study or what. I said, I'm happy for you to bring him, but you and I are going to talk, not him. Just you and I. He said, okay. So we went out for lunch, and he began his long discourse with his opening line, which was flawed. He began by saying to me, there are two kinds of logic. Actually, there are many more, but you don't stop a person that quickly. So I said, <laughs> keep going. And he said, there are two kinds of logic. And he said, Ravi, the kinds of logic are these. One is the law of non-contradiction, the either-or system of logic. If an affirmation is made, an assertion is made, it, you say it is either this or that, not both of these. And he gave several illustrations on this. He said, the problem with that either-or, non-contradictory type of logical system is that it's a Western way of thinking. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, keep moving on then. He said, there is a second kind of logic. That is the dialectical system of logic, both and, both this and that. He said, if you look at a systematic treatment of Eastern philosophy, you ask one person, is God personal? He says, yes. You ask the other person, is God personal? He says, no. You ask a third person who's right, he'll say, both of them. He says, because the Easterner does not worry about contradiction. It's the dialectical system of Hegel and Marx and on and on. And he went and he said, the dialectical both hand is an Eastern way of thinking. I said, no, it isn't. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it isn't. He said, yes, it is. I said, move on. <laughs> so he'd established these two propositions. The either or system of the law of non-contradiction is a Western way of thinking. The both hand dialectical system is an Eastern way of thinking. He drew his conclusion now. What you really need to do, Ravi, when you're studying Eastern philosophies, rather than saying that you've dismissed it because of systemic contradiction, is to say, but this is the way we think in the East, so it's okay. You should not worry about contradiction. They don't. He said, your problem is you're studying the Eastern religion as a Westerner. The irony of this conversation was this was a Westerner telling me that. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, sir, I just have one question for you. Because by now he'd used up all of his placemats and everything. And uh, uh, he'd drawn on everything. We'd finished our lunch, the psychologist and I. His was sitting congealed in front of him. So I said, I just have one question for you. What you're telling me, sir, is that when I'm studying Eastern philosophy, I either use the both-hand system of logic or nothing else. Is that right? that I either use the both hand system or nothing else, is that right? He just picked up his knife and fork. He put it down. And God is my witness. Here's what he says to me. 
The either or does seem to emerge, doesn't it? <laughs> I said, sir, I've got some shocking news for you. Even in India, we look both ways before we cross the street. It is either the bus or me, not both of us. <laughs> I said, and you've got your facts wrong. Shankara, the leading proponent of monism, of the Hindu kind, was an either-or believer. He believed in the law of non-contradiction. Gautama Buddha was born a Hindu. He rejected Hinduism and became and founded Buddhism because he subscribed to the law of non-contradiction. Muhammad very clearly subscribed to the law of non-contradiction. The question is whether those systems are true or not, standing up to their own tests by their own leading protagonists. I said, you know what? You spent the last hour using the law of non-contradiction with which to debunk it. You were telling me either I use your system or nothing else. As I, when I told my brother-in-law this was a Hindu convert, he said to me, he said, that's funny. He said, you're an evangelist. I'm an expositor. You go for the jugular. I go for the defense. He said, if he'd said that to me, I would have said, if both hand is all that you crack it up to be, why can't I use both the both hand and the either or? <laughs> it's a kinder, gentler version of what I've just said to you. <laughs> but when you look at the, when you look at postmodernity, no ontic referent for language, no objective place for logic. Thirdly, you move very quickly. There are no boundaries for meaning. There are no boundaries for meaning. And you know what? It is sad when you think of what happens in the lives of those who've lived it out. I don't want to celebrate this tragedy, but since postmodernism believes in the story, to a certain extent, without a meta-narrative. Let me read for you the story of a postmodernist. I'm reading for you how the life of Michel Foucault ended in 1984. I think he was about 56 years old. He was the grand professor of philosophy in Paris. He died there in the same hospital on which he had one writ once written a major book on madness and civilization. It is Oz Guinness who tells it so powerfully that for me to try to tell it in my own words would be rob the impact of the impact it had on me when I read it. Please give me your undivided attention. Night had fallen on Death Valley, but for the three men sitting there on the edge of a cliff in the spring of 1975, the darkness was anything but inert. It was crackling with anticipation and with the electronic music of Karl Heinz Stockhausen's contact. Soon, for each of them in different ways, it was also exploding with the ecstatic visions of their LSD tripping. Two of them, the young Americans, had experienced acid before, but for the third, a Frenchman in his late 40s, the experience was novel and shattering. Two hours later, he gestured towards the starry heavens. The skies exploded. The stars are raining down on me. I know this is not true, but for me, it is the truth. The trip was enough of a gamble for the Americans. It was their idea, and they might have just blown the fuses of the man they considered the master thinker of our era. It was a far greater risk for Foucault, world-famous philosopher, militant and professor at prestigious Collège de France, but when he, when he undertook eagerly, ever since he was a young man, Foucault had been on the Nietzschean quest to become what one is. Or as Nietzsche had expressed it most strangely, why am I really alive? What lesson am I to learn from life? How did I become what I am and why do I suffer from being what I am? Foucault aimed to complete this quest through the ordeal of limit experiences, going to the extremes, and through the discovery of the Dionysian element in his personality within. He had said once, it is forbidden to fid, forbid. But that night in Death Valley, he increased the stakes of his lifelong wager. He had always been fascinated with madness, violence, perversion, suicide, and death. Now he wanted to liberate himself further by transgressing all boundaries. Buffeted by a strong wind, 
The three men huddled together on the promontory. Foucault spake, spoke again, tears streaming down his face. I'm very happy tonight. I'm very happy. I have achieved a full perspective on myself. Now I understand my sexuality. We must go home now. Only Foucault's friends know the full story of that evening in Death Valley, but there's no question that it changed him, especially his thinking on sexuality. It propelled him with reckless abandon into the doomed mid-70s San Francisco world of free sex, powerful acid, altered states of consciousness, and death from AIDS. Defiant in its openness, reckless in its conviviality, the homosexual world of Castro, Polk, and Folsom streets had suddenly become one of the wildest, least inhibited sexual communities in history. For Michel Foucault, <clears throat> the lore was irresistible. He was a non-stop testing ground, rich in limit experiences for both body and mind. He ended up with that Faustian gamble, dying a horrific death of AIDS at the age of 56. That's his story. And you know what? I have a strong sense that the Son of God weeps at the loss and misplacement of such genius. He was a brilliant man. He was a brilliant man. But here's the point. Post-modernism writes out its individual stories by denying an overarching story. So they debunk words, they debunk logic, they debunk meaning, and they debunk the meta-narrative. There is no overarching story. You know, I've <clears throat> I was born and raised in India. And some time ago, my wife began to do a family tree study of my own life. She talked to one of my aunts who had lived to be 103. My wife comes from Canada. And she said, I want to know a little bit about Ravi's background and family. And page after page was written and written and written, and then I sent one to all of my brothers and sisters. I could only get back about seven generations. How wonderful it is to know your own background, your own family tree, from whence you came. Think about being in this world and knowing nothing about its origin knowing nothing about why you're here, knowing nothing about language, <clears throat> knowing nothing about meaning, knowing nothing about the story of why this world is meant to be. There's no meta-narrative. There's no overarching story. And ladies and gentlemen, von Schlegel years ago wrote a play about an audience sitting in an arena in an auditorium looking at a platform, <clears throat> waiting and waiting. The curtain rises. All of a sudden, all they see is the backs of people sitting on chairs facing the other side. And five minutes later, another curtain rises. And those on the stage are looking at another stage with other people sitting on their chairs and watching the backs of them waiting for another curtain to rise. After about 20 minutes of this, the people in the actual auditorium start looking around to see if they too <clears throat> are on a stage. There's no point of reference whether you're author or spectator. You know, the tragedy, as I said, is genius gone wrong. Let me close with a couple of thoughts for you here. And with that, I will come to an end. <clears throat> well, Sam, will you tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan? This is a young ordinand about to get his first interview. Yes, sir, I will, sir. Gladly, I will. Once there was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked him. <laughs> and as he went on his way, he didn't have no money. And there he met the Queen of Sheba, and she gave him a thousand talents and a hundred changes of raiment. And he got into a chariot and drove furiously. And when he was driving under a big juniper tree, his hair got caught on the limb of that tree, and he hung there many days, and the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. <laughs> One night when he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came along and cut off his hair. 
and he dropped and fell on stony ground. But he got up and went on and it began to rain. And it rained and rained 40 days and 40 nights. And he hid himself in a cave and he lived on locusts and wild honey. <laughs> then he went on till he met a servant who said, come take supper at my house. And he made excuse and said, no, I won't. I have married a wife and can't go. And the servant went on into the highways and in the hedges and compelled him to come in. After supper, he went on and came down there to Jericho. And when he got there, he looked up and saw that old queen Jezebel sitting down way up high in a window. And she laughed at him and he said, throw her down out there. And they threw her down. And he said, throw her down again. And they, and they threw her down 70 times seven. And of the fragments that remained, they picked up 12 baskets fulls, <laughs> besides women and children. And they said, blessed are the peacemakers, P-I-E-C-E. -E. <laughs> now whose wife do you think she will be on that judgment day? <laughs> it's a brilliant story, but it's not the story of the Good Samaritan. He didn't get the job. Do you know the story of the gospel? Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me that story so simple, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels heaven sang as they welcomed his word. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. She says, whisper it in my ear till I can see his love. Fanny Crosby, a blind woman. There's a story to be told. There's a story that's messed up and geniuses are leading our world astray. Take to the word, take to his reason, find his meaning and tell his story well. There are many who are waiting to hear good news, postmodernism, was bad news. God bless you. Thank you very much.